Hi everyone. Today we're going to start the second half of chapter five and we're going to start by going through an overview of isomerism. So remember from a while ago we talked about isomers and we said that isomers have the same molecular formula, but they might have slight differences. Um, and there are several different types of isomers. So let's make a flow chart for the different types of isomers. So at the top of our flow chart, we'll start with isomers. And then we can break that down into two categories. The first category is constitutional isomers. And we've talked about these previously. So constitutional isomers have different connectivity. So you might have the same molecular formula. So let's say you have a lot of carbons and hydrogens, but they're just connected in a different way. Um, now, because there's different connectivity, you'll also have different properties. And we'll go over some more examples in a bit, but let's finish our flow chart. So the other category under isomers is stereoisomers. And stereoisomers have the same connectivity but the three-dimensional layout is different. So the 3D layout is different. Now there's two different ways that the three-dimensional layout could be different. Um, so there's actually a further part of our flowchart down here. So we can have what are called enantiomers or diastereomers. Oh, I didn't leave myself enough room. Let me try that again. We'll shift the arrow over. There we go. All right. So let's talk about the difference between enantiomers and diastereomers. So previously we said that enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. And diastereomers are not mirror images, but they have the same connectivity. All right. So this might be a little confusing right now because we haven't seen any examples. So let's actually look at a couple of examples. All right, so let's look at an example of constitutional isomers. Okay, so let's say that we have five carbons. So we could just draw them all in a single chain or 
maybe we have two carbons in a chain and two, or sorry, three carbons in a chain and two methyl groups coming off of the second carbon. So if we count up the number of carbons, each one has five carbons. And if we count the number of hydrogens, we have three, two, 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 and three. So that would be three, five, seven, nine, uh, 12. <laughs> okay, and let's make sure our other constitutional isomer has the same number of hydrogens. So we have three, 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 and three. So that would be three times four, which is 12. So again, constitutional isomers, if we go back, have uh, the same molecular formula, but different connectivity. And therefore, they have different properties. Okay, so now let's look at an example of enantiomers. All right, so let's draw a molecule. We'll draw cyclohexane. And let's say it has a methyl group in a wedge position on the top. And then let's say right next to that, we have a methyl group in a dash. And then let's draw the mirror image. Now, are these mirror images superimposable? Well, let's check. So what if we flip the uh, structure on the right over like a pancake so or a piece of paper? We're just flipping it over. Well, if we do that, The top carbon methyl group will become a uh, dash because originally it was facing up towards us, but if we flip it over, it will actually face away from us. And then the dash will flip over to become a wedge. And let's number our carbons. One, Two. So if we flip that over, we have one, two. So is that structure superimposable on our first structure? No, the wedge and the dash are flipped, right? So enantiomers, again, are non-superimposable mirror images. And again, this is really similar to your left and right hands. Um, they are mirror images of each other if you hold them up in front of each other so that your palms are facing each other. But if you flip your right hand over, let's say, and try to lay it on top of your other hand, you can't uh, exactly match them because your thumbs will be on different sides, your pinkies will be on different sides, so they are non-superimposable mirror images. Okay, so then what about diastereomers? How are diastereomers different from enantiomers? So one classic example is uh, the molecule butene. So this is an alkene, it has a double bond. And there's two different ways that you can draw butene. Um, on the left-hand side, the carbons on each end are on the same side of the molecule. And on the right-hand structure, the two carbons on the ends are on opposite sides of the structure. So the first molecule on the left we would call cis and the molecule on the right is trans. 
So these two molecules have the same connectivity because we do have four carbons in a row with a double bond in the middle. However, they have a different 3D layout. So one is cis and one is trans. And no matter which way you rotate these molecules, you really can't turn the cis configuration into the trans configuration. You would have to do a reaction where you break the double bond and then let the bonds rotate and then reform the double bond. So that's way too much work. <laughs> so these are diastereomers. Okay. So let's summarize everything we talked about. So let's summarize constitution. <laughs> Did I spell that right? Yes, I think I just drew my eye funny and it threw me off. Constitutional isomers. All right, so again, constitutional isomers have different connectivity. And different physical properties. And remember, physical properties are things like boiling point, melting point, density, color, etc. So physical properties are things that you cannot change about a molecule. And I like to think about this uh, kind of like our own physical properties. Um, we have a certain hair color, a certain eye color. Um, you would have to for instance, perform a chemical reaction to change your hair color, right? So those are physical properties, things that you can't easily change. All right, and then with constitutional isomers, because they have different physical properties, we can separate them uh, using their difference in boiling points, for example. So maybe one constitutional isomer has a boiling point of 80 degrees Celsius, and the other constitutional isomer has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. You could heat up a mixture of the two to 80 degrees, and your first constitutional isomer will boil off, and then you'll just be left with your other constitutional isomer. So that would be a really easy way to separate them. All right, now let's go over enantiomers. So enantiomers have the same physical properties They're just non-superimposable mirror images. However, remember we said that they do rotate light in different ways. So if you have an R enantiomer versus an S enantiomer, one will rotate light in a positive direction, the other one will rotate light in a negative direction. So that could be one way to separate them. You could use that difference. Um, but it's really difficult, so they are difficult to separate. And we'll talk about how to actually separate them later. Um, and then diastereomers, they have different physical properties. So our cis and trans example, for instance, um, those would have different physical properties. So we can separate diastereomers fairly easily. All right, 
So this is just an introduction to the different types of isomers that uh, we can uh, have in organic chemistry. Next time, we're going to learn how to identify or classify isomers. Um, and we're going to go through four different molecular formulas. Um, and then we'll draw the different isomers and see if we can figure out whether they're constitutional isomers, stereoisomers, or diastereomers. Um, or, oh, excuse me, enantiomers or diastereomers. All right, so I will see you then.